Good morning. And it's great to see you guys here this morning. We're going to start out with a couple different songs. Uh, the first one is uh, A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. If you could join and stand, up, uh, stand and sing with us, join us. It's 151 in your hymnal if uh, you'd like to look there. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and on with cruel fate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man. The man of God's own choosing Dost ask who that may be Christ Jesus, it is he Lord, say his name From age to age the same And he must win the battle and though this world with devils filled Should threaten to undo us We will not fear, for God hath willed His truth and triumph through us The Prince of Darkness grim we tremble not from him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, one little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours Through Him who with us sided Let good and kindred go This mortal life also The body they may kill God's truth abideth still his kingdom is forever. And next, for the beauty of the earth. thoughts 
Thank you, and please be seated. This helps a little bit. As soon as I started speaking, I went, uh-oh, something's wrong. I realized I was without the microphone. All right. Today marks, you know, all, all, you know, you think of milestones. For me, it's a milestone. Been here a year now. This was the first Sunday I started full-time. It was a year ago, first Sunday in November. I came in October during a super snowstorm, candidated, and came back, and my first Sunday was the first Sunday in November. So this has been a year. So uh, I'm excited and uh, happy for the year that God has given us and happy for the opportunity to be here and to serve the Lord together with you and to get to know you better. I know you better now than I did then. So uh, hopefully continue to get to know you better. And uh, again, happy for the opportunity to serve the Lord with you and what God is wanting to do and will do, I think, through this ministry. We have some announcements. November 4th for the Awana program, Red, White, and Blue Night, 6 p.m. November 4th, uh, same night, youth group at Grace Point. Contact Joanne for carpooling. Then on November 9th, the My Group, which is Mission Youth, my means Mission Youth Group, 7 p.m. on November 9th. 10th is the board meeting uh, at 7 p.m. November 26th, our Thanksgiving meal. Uh, the location is here, and the time is at 2 p.m. That's when they'll start serving. They could come a little earlier than that, but food will be served at 2. You can come, be a part of that. I know a lot of families do things and have uh, activities together on Thanksgiving, and that's all well and good. But if you're not and uh, you have uh, opportunity, come and, and uh, help us to welcome folks from the community uh, to the meal and to interact with some folks like that. Then uh, updates, uh, be painting walls. And actually, yesterday, a lot of the walls got painted, the hallway walls, the walls in the um, nursery, going down into the basement, um, you know, just maybe express appreciation for uh, the Bucks. They were here till at least 8 o'clock last night working, painting. Uh, spent most of all their day here yesterday, and we appreciate that. But um, So we're still working on things uh, that we can uh, get done. Any other announcements that uh, I am forgetting that I need to maybe draw your attention to? Uh, don't want to miss something that you might have. Yes, Linda. All right, Christmas child, uh, items to be brought in, and will there be a kind of a list of, of ideas of what to bring? I mean, you don't want to bring perishables, I know that. You can look on that and pick up things that maybe when you're in a store somewhere, pick up some things, bring them. Okay, very good, all right. It's always a fun time for the young people, and it's a, it's a good program, certainly, uh, for that. All right, anybody else? Maybe announce what I'm missing. All right? Okay, under prayer and praise, uh, we've been, uh, Jerry Monroe, most of you know uh, this family. Gene Monroe's husband passed away yesterday, not from COVID. Uh, funeral plans are pending. Uh, but he has been on dialysis for a long time and has uh, 
chosen, he chose to go off of dialysis in the process, went home to be with the Lord. So uh, you might want to remember the Monroe family. Uh, I don't have any other information on that. I suppose you could probably go on the internet. Do we know what uh, funeral home is going to be doing that? Bismarck Funeral Home. So maybe go on their website, uh, and I'm sure they'll have some information on that if you uh, need more information. Uh, pray for Marla. She's had some tests done and going to be getting the results back on those on Monday. And pray for Sharon. She's having a lot of dental work to be done. Uh, beginning very soon, and uh, just pray that that will all go well. Uh, certainly this week we're very much aware of the election and the direction that uh, the nation goes in that decision will really impact us in a lot of different ways. But as we were talking about in our prayer time today, we don't really, uh, you know, as important as this election is, we're not looking for Trump or anybody else to solve our problems. We know our eyes are on the Lord, and uh, we're going to keep our eyes there and trust Him for all of what comes in the days ahead. And for wisdom for our leaders, know how to handle some of these issues that's going to be happening. So those are some of the prayer requests that I'm aware of. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing. Father, we know that every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Thank you that you are totally loving in how you treat us. While you don't show favoritism in the way you love us, your love is unconditional, your love is is uh, always present in our lives. There's nothing we can do to make you love us more. There's nothing we can do to make you love us less. Uh, you are the epitome of love, and we're studying on that, and we're learning more about love and how that needs to be reflected in our lives. I pray that you would convict us in the areas where we have failed and help us to be more... Uh, alert and attuned to the opportunities to demonstrate your love uh, to those that are hurting and wounded among us. And Father, I pray that you would just uh, keep us in the center of your will and a focus. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to serve you in this place. Thank you for good things that have happened and others that we want to see happen uh, in this ministry for this community and as a lighthouse in this area. Uh, Father, I pray that we would uh, magnify your name in all we say and do. Thank you again for your uh, guidance in our lives. Uh, Lord, every day we seek your face. We know that we need you and, and we need your guidance. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to be attuned, listening well to you from your word. And as the Holy Spirit directs and guides our hearts and lives, may, Father, we be very uh, willing and anxious to be obedient to the Word of God and to your instruction for our lives. Father, I pray that you'd be with us today. As we've come together today, I pray this to bring our worship to you. Uh, this service is not about us. This service is about you. And so, Father, we uh, lift you up and we want to exalt and glorify you. We do pray for Marlis and her test results we pray for uh, you to work in a very special way and meet her needs. We pray for Sharon as she has to uh, go through this process of her dental work and pray that that might be successful and everything would go well there. We pray for the Monroe family. Uh, Father, even though uh, Jerry has been uh, bedfast for a while and has gone through a lot of difficulties in his health, uh, Father, it's still hard to prepare when a loved one goes to be with you. So we pray for uh, Jean Monroe and for her family and pray that you give her the support, the encouragement that she needs and uh, pray that you would comfort her in these days. I pray for our election, Father. Uh, pray that you would just have your will and way. Uh, we know that our our hearts can totally depend upon you and trust you for the outcomes, whatever it might be. We pray that it might be, uh, again, a way that we might, regardless of the decisions that are made, 
use those decisions to bring glory and honor to your name, to point others to Christ. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this church and this ministry. I pray you'd help us to just really desire to get involved, uh, to be connected, uh, to make a difference, bring about change in the hearts and lives of people that you would send this way. Thank you again for the opportunity to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to have a couple more songs. Next song we have is Think About His Love. You can stand if you're able. Think about His love. Think about His goodness. Think about His grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. Again. Think about His love. Think about His goodness. Think about His grace that's brought us through. So great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. And come to the table. Come to the table of mercy. Back in 1 Corinthians 13 again today. Um, I don't know if some of you watched the movie Crocodile Dundee, but let me give you a scene from that. This man from Australia is cornered by a, group, a gang of thugs, and when Dundee doesn't immediately turn over his wallet to them, one of the hoodlums pulls out a switchblade and threatens him with it. At that moment, Crocodile Dundee reaches behind his back with the words, that's not a knife. This is a knife. And he pulled a knife, a huge knife out from behind his back, uh, one of these big Bowie knives, and it scared the tar out of the people, and, and they ran away and fled for their lives. Well, in a similar way, when you come to 1 Corinthians 13, Paul kind of says to us, that's not love. This is love. This is what love really looks like, what it ought to look like in our lives. You know, loving the world in general is not all, that difficult. But loving certainly certain people around us 
can be a major challenge. That's because we don't always feel like loving. 1 Corinthians 13 describes a love, agape love, a love that describes God's love for us. Now, I understand it's not intended to be showing us His love for us. It's intended to show us the kind of love that we ought to be manifesting to other people. But certainly, if you were to look at the life of Christ, you see this characteristics totally modeled in Him. He loved this way. But this is a love that we're to have for God and our neighbor. A love based not on feelings, but on choice. When obedient to God's commands to love, feelings may or may not follow, but that doesn't matter because it's a love that's not dependent upon the response of the person being loved. It's a selfless love. And it's a love that we have learned so far is long-suffering, is kind, it does not envy, doesn't boast in itself, is not arrogant or filled with pride, it isn't rude, and it does not seek its own. And when I read that list, all I can say is, God help me, because I can't love this way in my own strength. There's no way I can perform that kind of love. Uh, it's not in me to love this way. And so my prayer is, Lord, help me to understand what this love looks like and let your love flow through me to others. I've read and even said, love is not, love is an action, not an emotion. By that, I'm saying I don't have to feel loving to be loving. I want to be obedient first and then let my feelings follow. And there are some situations uh, that we face where loving is hard. It may involve confrontation. It may involve discipline. It may involve um, difficult people. But I have a responsibility to do what's best for the other person, whether I feel like it or not. But I think it might be better said to say love is active, not passive. Because if we say that there's no emotion, if I, if I go that route, then love without feeling can become sterile and we begin to just do it out of duty and, and it's not very long before people recognize that's not the kind of love that really communicates God's love. Romans 12, 9 puts it very simply. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, and cling to what is good. Let love be without hypocrisy. Don't just pretend to love. Don't talk about being loving. Don't love some and not others. Be very sincere in your love. Again, the key to loving with, with compassion is found in our love and our intimacy and our relationship with the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where my feelings have to come from. That's where they'll be generated. As I grow in my love and my appreciation and my understanding of His love for me, then I have a greater capacity to love others with the same kind of love. The greater my ability to love, as described in verse 13, uh, then the greater I can be an impact and have an impact for others for Christ. I want to read again 1 Corinthians 13. Again, just I think it's helpful for us to read it and to see it in its context again. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, and that's where we're going to stop today, it's not provoked. We're going to look at that quality here. Love is not easily provoked. Love is not easily irritated. So let's try to expand our understanding of this trait. 
He's saying love is not or it does not blow its fuse. It's not given to emotional outbursts. And some people say, hey, I get angry, but, you know, it's over really quick. I can get angry and I can get mad, but then it's over and everything clears out. Well, you know, a hand grenade blows up really fast, but there's a lot of destruction that's left behind in the wake uh, of an explosion like that. And it's certainly true from an emotional standpoint when people are given to outbursts. But this kind of love refuses to let other people get under your skin. It doesn't get exasperated with petty offenses. It's not touchy. Uh, You know people, and I know people, someone that you have to handle with kid gloves. It's like walking around them on eggshells. Uh, You're just afraid that you're going to do something to set them off. You avoid them when you can. But when you can't, you measure every word so as not to be misunderstood by them. But love doesn't react in self-defense or retaliation. Love doesn't explode with anger or resentment. Now, it is possible to be angry and sin not. There is such a thing as righteous anger. Uh, Jesus turned over tables in the temple, and he ran out the money changers with a whip. Uh, He was angry at their lack of compassion of the spiritual leaders when he would heal uh, on the Sabbath, or he'd cast out demons on the Sabbath, and they would uh, criticize him for it. He didn't, you know, he didn't appreciate their lack of compassion for the people he was trying to help. Paul knew what it was to be provoked, and he got provoked in Athens. When you read in, in Acts chapter 17, verse 16, it says, Now when Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. There is a love that opposes moral evil. Uh, When we know something is wrong and we are moved to action to protect and defend others, to take a stand for the gospel, it's okay to be provoked in those areas. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. Here he's focusing on how we respond when offenses get personal, when it happens to me. What happens to you, how we respond, uh, when we feel attacked, or when we are marginalized, or hurt, or persecuted for our faith, when we are taken advantage of, then how do I respond in those situations? And he tells us love is not easily provoked. A love, it, it, takes, it, it, it can take a lot before it responds. Irritability is said is rooted in two things. One is selfishness. Whenever I, you know, others don't fit into my plans and my schedules, and I can get irritated, and uh, I can become provoked. Self-centeredness that demands that I be served first, that I be listened to first, that I always have to be first. And if I don't get that, then uh, I get provoked. I get irritated. Or it's a fa- and so secondly, a failure to rest in the plan of God. You know, I can get frustrated, and I can get uh, upset with people or circumstances beyond my control. Now, how often do we get, you know, in situations where traffic jams just upset us? We get irritated. We get provoked because we're in a traffic jam. You know, I don't. That doesn't happen to me very often now. But when I was uh, working outside the church, when I was working in a funeral home, or or even at FedEx or whatever. And I had to be there at a certain time, and I would always allow what I thought was enough time, and inevitably you'd have a traffic jam on the interstate. And I'd get provoked, I'd get irritated, thinking, why is this happening? You know, I, I, it didn't take very much sometimes to get me irritated over things that really were outside my control. But anxiety increases my irritability and causes me to think even more myself. But confidence in God frees me to meet the needs of others. Now, I can make all kinds of excuses, usually blaming other people for my irritability, uh, for my bad mood, for being provoked to anger. But the Word of God says that the root problem is an, an unloving spirit, an unloving attitude. I mean, we just have to mark it down. When this is characteristic of our lives, we are not loving. I don't care if it's people at work or people in the home, or people in the church, 
or wherever you find yourself, if we are provoked easily, if we get irritated easily, just know you're, you're a pretty unloving person, okay? From the standpoint of God's definition of love, all right? Signs of sinful anger are being provoked or irritable when our anger ignites too fast. We're primed. We're ready to fire up like a small engine with just a little bit of pressure, a pull, a tug, and our emotions are running. Uh, when I was working at FedEx, I worked there for about four years on third shift, and uh, there was a gentleman there that really was a problem for me. Uh, he provoked me. He irritated me. Uh, when you uh, are in a, in a warehouse operating uh, forklifts and you've got about 30, 40 other forklift drivers in the same room or in the same building and you're passing each other with freight a lot of times, but you're passing each other and you're moving around to all different kinds of places within that building to get your, your, uh, the, the packages you know, where they needed to be delivered. Uh, when you first start, it's a very scary thing. You get on one of those forklifts, and you know you can kill somebody with those. You can run over somebody. If you're not paying attention, somebody's in your lane, uh, and they're walking, you can run over them. Or even when you put the product down on, on skids, and you slide it into the place. If, if there's an empty skid in front of that, you could slide it, and it tripped the person behind it. I mean, there's all kinds of ways of hurting people with a machine like that. So when you start out early, you're, you're going really slow. You're taking your time. You're looking everywhere until you get comfortable knowing how to drive a forklift and take turns and all the other kinds of things. You go slow. But this gentleman had been doing it for years, and he didn't like people who were just learning. He didn't like people going slow. It got in his way. Uh, he, and he would let you know. If you were going too slow or if you got in his way, he would cuss you out. All the ways he's driving by you, he'd be cussing you out. And I, he did that for quite a while with me. And I decided one night on my way from home to, to work, I was going to put a stop to it. I'd, had, I'd been provoked enough. I was going to stop letting him. He was not going to cuss me out anymore. He's a big black man. And, uh, and he'd just been there a lot longer than any, you know, than any of the rest of us. And, but I just decided I'm not, I've had enough of his language, his foul mouth, and all the other kind of stuff. And so I determined that night I was going to take care of it. I was going to put a stop to it. I was going to confront him. But on my way there, the Lord just seemed to say, Mark, uh, how have you showed him love? You know, before you jump into trying to fix this problem, maybe you ought to love him a little bit more. Well, that isn't what I wanted to do at that particular time. It wasn't my first reaction. It wasn't from me. I said, Lord, if you'll help me, I'll figure out a way to show him love. And so I began doing a number of different things for him. I'd get there early, and I'd do things for it, to get his forklift ready for the, for the, for the shift. And, I just, and he, he wouldn't know what to do with it. He would come in. I'd say, Dwayne, I already took care of that for you. You don't have to go out in the winter. You don't have to go out in the snow to get your tank or anything else. I already took care of it for you. You did? You know, and, he just, and I just began doing different things like that to try to just show him I loved him. And it was amazing. It wasn't very long that he stopped cussing me out. It wasn't very long that he started asking my opinion about things. It wasn't very long that after that he came to me and asked me if I would pray for his brother who was dying of cancer. And I said, not only will I pray, I'll go visit him. And I made some visits to this man's home. And he was dying of throat cancer and, and, and all that. And, and it wasn't very long after that he died. And that family invited me to speak at this man's funeral. I was one of only, I was one of about eight or nine people that spoke at his funeral, the only white guy to get to speak at his funeral. And I built a relationship with Dwayne that he still to this day, we call each other, we talk to each other, we ask how each other's doing. And I've witnessed him, I've shared Christ with him, and he says he's a believer, but he's certainly not a disciple or had not been a disciple, but but he grew to really love me, and I him. And I guarantee you, if I would have had my way, and if I would have confronted him, and I would have stopped him from cussing me out, I would have never had a relationship with him. It would never have happened. But God just put it in my heart. You know, don't be provoked. Love this guy. 
And it was really a life-changing experience for me to just see how love worked. I mean, it really did work in that situation. So it's easy to be loveless, isn't it? And usually, it's over minor, silly, stupid things. When our anger lasts too long, some people just love to hold on to offenses and bitterness for months and years. That's sinful anger. Good rule of thumb is when we cross the line is when we sleep on our anger. You remember Ephesians 4.26 says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. That's true in relationships with husbands and wives, but it's true in any kind of a relationship. If, you know, if we know there's a problem, we ought to seek it out and get it fixed just as soon as we possibly can so that uh, we can bring healing. Don't allow the fire to blaze. When we harbor too much anger, when our anger becomes uh, a, a desire for revenge or strong internal emotions that passions that fl- and so inflame us, we don't even want to look at that person. Or we're tre- then we're treading in God's territory. In Romans chapter 12, in uh, verse 19, he said, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. You know, when you get to that point, you're crossing over into, into territory you have no business being in. In fact, he says in verse 14, Bless those who persecute you, Bless and do not curse. Now again, I know I can't do that in my own strength. That's something that God has to allow and, and help me to accomplish. Uh, I have to be very intentional in the way I try to love. And I know it can only come from God. Let's consider three principles to curb our anger. One's a soft answer turns away wrath, Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath. But then he goes on to say, uh, and i got to turn to it here because I, I didn't have it down. Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know, I've been told that, you know, advised or counseled, hey, when, when something gets really hot and heavy, just start talking in a low voice where they have to stop to be able to hear what you're saying because then if they have to stop it lessens the intensity of the argument or whatever just start almost talking a whisper to where they have to listen carefully to what you're saying and it's it's just that idea the soft answer turns away wrath. don't react in anger it only makes things worse realize that sinful anger doesn't glorify god In James chapter 1, verse 19, he says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Uh, We also read again in James chapter uh, 3, verse 17, where he says, The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Simple anger doesn't glorify God. We can't please Him if we're prone to irritability or to being provoked. Recognize God's sovereign providential rule in your life. If I get provoked easily... My sin is just not is not just against people or circumstances that are going on in my life. The ultimately, it's against the, my Father in heaven. So to persist in anger is contrary to the will of God for my life. My Father's care is wisdom, is love. What arrogance! What self-centeredness and sight, what self-sighted short-sightedness! What rebellion is in my heart uh, that I can't trust Him for what's going on? In my life, that's contrary to agape love. But then finally, consider our Savior's example. And as we're coming to communion here in just a little bit, we're reminded of our Savior's love, aren't we? And though He was 100% God, Jesus in His humanity left us an example that we are to follow. I want to look at two passages, one in the Old Testament one in the New, just to remind us of how he reacted and how he responded in love and how provoking was not a part of his character. He was not easily provoked. 
love didn't allow that for him. Again, he was provoked at moral sin and unrighteousness and how others were hurt, but when it came to how he was impacted by personal offenses, he was never given to being provoked. In Isaiah 50, verse 5, The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. This is speaking of the Lord Jesus. I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. He is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. And then the challenge is given to us in verse 10. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Let's see how that's fleshed out in 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 21. Here he says, for to you, this you were called because Christ has suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, neither was the seed found in his mouth. And notice, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. That's what we read about the servant in Isaiah chapter 50. And here we read it again. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. Who when he suffered, he did not threaten. You know why? Because he was demonstrating love. He didn't, he didn't react. He didn't respond negatively. Uh, may I say, here's an example of long-suffering. He could have called 10,000 angels, I mean, in a sense, of, of who he was and his power. Now, he couldn't have done it and, and, not provide, and, and still provide salvation for us. We know he came and he did the will of the Father, but he was long-suffering. He's, his was an example of obedience, an example of unselfishness, an example of trust in the Father. If you were to summarize, you'd have to say he loved. That's what he did. Love is not easily provoked. How easy is it for you to be provoked? How easy is it for you to be irritable? Who are you going to blame it on? How are you going to handle it? When are we going to confess it as sin and say, Lord, I am not loving like I ought to love. I'm too self-centered. I'm too all these things... I, that's descriptive of love, what it's not, but we find ourselves doing those things that love is not, at that point do we say, Lord, I confess. I'm not as loving as I ought to be. I'm, I've made too many excuses. Uh, Father, help me to love this way, to love others this way, to make a difference in their lives. I don't know the person. You know, there are people who just knows how to touch our buttons, don't they, and knows how to provoke us. Those people need to be loved. We need to love them with God's love. I hope and pray that we can become more and more a loving fellowship, a loving congregation, a loving individual with one another and with our families and with our friends and with our co-workers and with other people that we might be able to communicate God's love them in a way they've never maybe experienced it before. Father, I love you. Thank you for this time to be together. I pray now that you would prepare our hearts and minds as we have thought about love and as we have seen it certainly illustrated in our Savior. Uh, Father, who was reviled but did not revile again, who was threatened but he did not threaten. Uh, he trusted the Father. Father, I pray that we can love like that, 
that despite how people respond to that love, maybe to abuse or take advantage of us in that love, that we would still choose to love because love is active and love is a choice. I pray that we would learn to love without hypocrisy, that it might be truly the sincere desire of our heart uh, because we are growing in our understanding of your love for us. Father, I, I confess this is not something that I can do or manufacture in my own heart and life. I know that if I depend upon that, I'm going to fail and I'm going to hurt people around me. Uh, I pray that you'd help me to love with this kind of love. May all these characteristics be uh, manifested in such a way that your love is central, that we would avoid the things that would take away, but that we would actually do the reverse. When, when, lo when love is not rude, that we would be very gentle, that we'd be very caring in how we do uh, life with other people. Uh, all of those characteristics that are negative, may we turn them into a positive way to communicate your love. Now as we prepare for communion, Father, I pray that you'd prepare our hearts and minds uh, for this very special time which we gather together to remember the cross, to remember the second coming, to remember the sacrifice, to remember the gift of life that was given to us by the great, great price of our Savior who died on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to just, I want to say a few words here about um, communion, and we'll share in that together. In John chapter 6, we have Jesus' discourse on the bread of life. I was drawn to this passage because Jesus makes reference to his death and resurrection and to our resurrection as well. I want to read a few verses, beginning in verse 51 of John chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, I didn't ask them to put this up. But in John 6, 51, it says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of the bread, this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Now as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats of this bread will live forever. What a strange message to the Jews who heard Jesus speak. In fact, it may sound like a real strange message to us today, really, when we read that and we think about that. Uh, they thought he was being literal. They thought he was teaching somehow some form of cannibalism. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, understand, he's not speaking about communion here. This is, communion would be a year later before he would eat that last meal with his disciples. So that's not what we're... He's actually, and it's an evangelistic appeal. It's an appeal to people to trust Christ uh, and believe on him for eternal life. But the elements of communion do symbolize what he's saying here. So before we explain the passage, let's look at the context. Jesus had just fed 5,000 people, and those who experienced this miracle wanted more of the same. And they were willing to accept him on those terms. He was a miracle worker and a food provider. And we read in verse 26, Most surely I say to you, you seek me not because you saw a sign, but because you, were, you, are, you ate of the loaves and you were filled. They focused on the physical but lacked the spiritual insight and perception. 
Verse 27, he says, Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Jesus is not condoning laziness in here when he says, Do not uh, labor for food that perisheth. Uh, we need, he, he's basically wanting us to turn our attention, our efforts on things that are eternal. Invest in things that last forever. And they wanted work to do. They said in verse 28, What shall we do that we may do the works of God? Or we may work the works of God. You can't earn salvation by works, can you? Nothing you can do to earn God's favor by works. So in verse 29, Jesus tells them, This is the work of God, that you believe on Him that sent me. Just believe on Him that sent me. Jesus gives them one thing to do, and that's to believe. They understood what he was saying, so in verse 30, they ask him again, all right, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Give us a sign, a reason that we ought to trust you. Our fathers ate manna from heaven for 40 years. Can you do greater miracles than what Moses did? And Jesus corrects them and reminds them that Moses didn't give them that bread. Nor did the manna satisfy them because they came to loathe the manna. They were tired of it. And he says they also died. So the bread didn't satisfy them physically uh, and it didn't give them eternal life. Even the bread of angels could not provide eternal life. But he reminds them that the bread is really, the true bread is a person. He says then verse 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And then he says in verse 48, I am the bread of life. He makes it clear that he's talking about his provision and who he was and what he would do. And so the theme of life and the resurrection is prominent here. We're talking about living bread. One who has the authority over the resurrection. Notice how many times he mentions the resurrection. In verse 40, he says, This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 54, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. That's our hope, isn't it? The resurrection. The message of salvation is that the work has already been done and all that's necessary is to believe. Verse 51, he says, I am the living bread. He goes on to say, and I shall give, the bread that I give shall be my flesh, which I will give to the life of the whole world. Christ's bodily sacrifice. I'll give my flesh. His blood pictures the atoning value of his death for the life of the world. That voluntary and vicarious death as our substitute. So let's answer the question. How shall I eat this flesh? How do I eat this flesh and drink this blood? Are the Catholics right? When we take communion, does the blood or the bread and the, and the cup actually become the flesh and the blood of the Lord Jesus? Literally, no. All we have to do is compare a few verses to understand. He tells us in verse six, chapter 6, verse 40, this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. He says in verse 40, 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. So the idea of eating or drinking his blood, eating his flesh, has to do with believing. <laughs> When we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did for us at Calvary, everyone that beholds the Son and believes has everlasting life. I'll raise Him in the last day. He that eateth my flesh drink, I'll, has eternal life. I'll raise Him up in the last day. Verse 56, He talks about the importance of just dwelling. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in Him. He remains in me. The more I love Him, the more I can trust Him, the more intimacy and security 
that I have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, it's important that we identify with the sacrifice. Now, we who have trusted Christ as our Savior, we have done this. You know, again, this is not a message necessarily to us, but we can learn from it, and we can begin to appreciate the sacrifice. Again, it's important to remember, Jesus is not talking about communion, but how a person can have eternal life. But what it does remind us is of his sacrifice, the giving of his body, the shedding of his blood, so that we might receive the free gift of eternal life simply by believing in the voluntary sacrifice of his love, life which he gave for the whole world, he says. I do this for the whole world. I love that phrase, which I shall give for the life of the world. It's available to anybody, to everybody, who would like to enjoy and experience salvation. But it came at great cost. He knew what it was going to cost, and yet he went to the cross anyway. He suffered and he died for us. So we're going to be observing here in a moment the Lord's table. A reminder of his sacrifice for us. But also a reminder of the victory that is ours. The victory that comes when one day he'll come and take us home to be with him again. He will come and take us away so that we might spend eternity with him. So we have this assurance. So we want to take a moment just to examine our own hearts. It's always good. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we are to examine ourselves. Uh, and the, the thought there is just to make sure, you know, this is a picture of our unity in Christ. If you are not unified, you know, if, there, if God knows your heart and there's division, there's, there's um, bitterness or anger toward anybody, you ought not take this. Because you do that, you do it in an unworthy manner because it it's not what it represents for us. So we examine our hearts and lives and say, Lord, you know, is there anything revealed to me? If there's something I need to take care of, if there's sin in my life, if there's something I need to deal with, if there's a person I need to deal with, Lord, help me to do that. And then we will partake. So let's just take a few moments to pray and ask the Lord's help. Matthew's Gospel, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave his disciples. I want to bless the bread. I'm asking Rod if he would to bless the bread. About how you gave. Um, your body for us. And Father, we know that that was nothing, nothing short of an incredibly painful and difficult experience of what you went through 
to be beaten like that. Um, and yet at the same time, in, in the midst of that, you came back and said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Father, we thank you for that love that you have for us, that you are so ready to forgive the offenses against you. And Father, we pray that that would be our case also, and that we would be willing to look to you for your example and what you're doing. And Father, I just pray that you would, would help us in the midst of that to really be the same type of person that you want, and at the same time, to just be looking to you just for the incredible gift that you gave just by giving yourself for us, for suffering like you did and dying like you did, for giving like you did. And Father, we know that that's so that we could have life. And we just want to thank you for that. And that because of you, we do have life. It says, as they were eating, he blessed and broke the bread and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks. Laren, I ask you to bless the cup if you would. Oh, dear Father, you have showed that your love for us knows no limits. In the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, we thank you for the new covenant in his blood, for the forgiveness of our sins. His shed blood has washed us and made us whiter than snow. We praise you, Lord God, and we proclaim your glory, grace, and mercy until Jesus comes again. Amen. It says, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, drink you all of it. For this is my blood in the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day that I drink it with new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out of the Mount of Olives. At this time, we're going to sing a song, closing song, and have you stand if you're able. And uh, let's see, what, what's the page number? Page 429? Okay, thank you. one's dignity and save each one's pride 
And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come. And all praise to Christ Jesus, His only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes, makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Thank you. Have a great week.